Hi, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And this is the Doom Steve Audio Fit. You, you know what it is, right? I think I do, yes. Oh, you were talking to the listener. Sorry. We're here with a kind of a special event for you. Um, this is our New Media Expo uh, live recording episode. Um, we did one of these last year at the New Media Expo, and it took us a whole year to actually get it onto the feed. This time around, we have stepped up the effort, and it only took us six months. Next year, man, it's going to be ready by March. <laughs> no, it won't. Yeah, that's probably not true. But anyways, uh, we just thought we'd give you a quick intro explanation to that this thing was recorded live, which, although we tried to make sure everyone in the room had a microphone and would be fine, it didn't all work out. It's live, and there, something always goes to crap because of that. Um, this time around, it turns out it was Renee Chambliss's mic. She had it in her hands. I don't think it was turned on. I think right. that was the problem. We turned it off uh, at a, when we were recording something else. And forgot to turn it back on for hers. So all of her comments we managed to sort of get from other mics in the room. But hopefully you'll forgive us for the uh, the, the difficulty in hearing what she has to say. And it's too bad because she always has good stuff to say. We even considered having her, uh, you know, loop in the audio afterwards. But that just seemed like too much to ask of poor Renee, which we ask a lot of her anyways. We're going to roll with it. I think it's it's good enough that uh, only sometimes will you pull your hair out as you listen to it. But I think the episode itself is worth it. I, I thought it was really fun to do and fun to hear. All right. Then listen and enjoy. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Let's start recording now. Quiet, we've already started. I'm hunting wabbits. You <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. And once again, we're doing a... We can't call it live. Our no, lawyers you, have said no. Yeah, you can't record something and then call it live. And it's not unedited, because I'm going to edit the beep out of it. Uh, what is it? It's uh, as live. A look live? Look live, yeah, that's what we call it in the biz. Ooh, and I'm already bored. <laughs> uh, today we are at the New Media Expo uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, and we are in the Rio Hotel and Casino. Uh, once again, all gathered to do an episode that's almost live. When I'm speaking now, we are live. There you go. Perfect. And uh, we're going to bring a story, of course, to you today. And this is a, a story written by Big himself. Do you want to introduce that? I suppose I could. Uh, the story is called Through the Din of Silence, mostly because I couldn't think of a better title. Well, we'll discuss the title afterwards. <laughs> but we have a big group with us. And let me introduce everybody. And everybody has a part in the production Let's let's go straight to the story, and we'll introduce everybody afterwards. Really? When we get into the big chat. That's how we did it last year, which just came out r right before we got here today. So it's fresh in my memory. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll just get the story going right away, and then we'll this is come Schmiegel. out and introduce it. Whoa. I didn't hear anything. Oh, okay. Um, I, I hear no voice telling me to kill. So anyways, yeah, the story's called Through the Din of Silence by B.D. Yanklevich, and uh, after the story, the feedback. No! Oh, sorry. I mean, we'll, we'll do the other stuff. Okay. okay. Enjoy, folks. Through the Din of Silence by B.D. Yanklevich The appointment was next week, and Greta could see no way to avoid it. If she didn't show up, Department of Health and Human Services agents would be on her doorstep within 24 hours. At least that was what had happened to Greta's friend, Shalise. Bryson, she said, calling her son's name. He didn't glance up from the stack of blocks he was making, already higher than she would have thought possible. 
Bryson. She called again in a carrying whisper. He still didn't glance up, but remained intensely focused on his tower. Greta frowned. She wished things could be different. She only had a week left with the boy, and due to his condition, he wouldn't even respond to her calling his name. She just wanted to hug him, hold him to her breast, and keep him safe forever. But that was impossible. The appointment was next week. Tears welled up in her eyes. She rose off of the couch, where she'd been watching Bryson play, went over and picked him up, hugging him close. Bryson complained with incoherent grunts, reaching for his block stack. He wasn't done, and he wanted Mommy to leave him alone. Greta ignored his squawks and pressed his face to hers. I love you, Bryson. I love you so much. I wish I could keep you forever. Don't be ridiculous, Greta, said her husband, Keith, his voice preceding his footsteps as he entered the living room on his way to work. You know what a problem that would cause. Thanks for filling me in, honey, she said, her voice icy with sarcasm. Especially on the pet name Honey, she set Bryson back on the carpet, and he immediately returned to his tower of blocks. Come on, Greta. Don't be mad at me. I didn't make the law. It's not my fault. You just need to detach yourself. Getting emotional will only make it worse. Can't you get some sort of exception, Keith? Said Greta, like a driver shifting into reverse. Desperation replaced the scorn in her voice. You're a city councilman. That ought to be worth something, isn't it? The plastic smile dropped off Keith's face. His eyes tightened. I can't believe you'd even ask that. But... Greta stammered. It's twice as important for me to live up to every little law or rule out there. I'm a city councilman, not a sports star or an actor. Please, honey, this is our son. I realize that, Greta, but it doesn't change anything. Don't worry, we can try again. He's only our first child. The Kapoors didn't have a baby that passed the test until their fifth child. It's just the way things are, honey. You've got to get with the times. But he's a child, not some animal. Don't you feel anything? Of course I feel bad, Gret. I love Bryson just as much as you do. But we knew this would probably happen when we got pregnant in the first place. It's just the way it is. Tears were streaming down her face now, completely unchecked. How could Keith dare to claim that he loved Bryson as much as she did? Greta would be surprised if he loved him at all, or ever had. He'd gone into this with no hopes at all, and he'd never allowed himself to get attached to the child in the least. It always seemed as if he were caring for Bryson as a job, instead of as his parent. Greta wiped her eyes and sniffed the snot that was now running from her nose. It was wise and safe, she supposed, for Keith to protect his emotions like that. But it was also cold and monstrous. She didn't know if she could stay with him if he just stood by and allowed them to take Bryson away. Anyway, honey, I've got to go. I'm going to be late. We can talk about this more later if you want. He stepped in and gave her a peck on the cheek. She flinched, although she'd tried desperately not to. Once the door was closed, she stepped over and picked Bryson, complaining, up off the carpet. She hugged him close again. Don't worry, Bryson. I won't let them get you. I won't let Daddy get you either. I love you so much. Greta smiled over the video line. She looked hideous, purposefully. But she smiled through the makeup job and the false sheen of sweat she'd applied, hoping it would make it more realistic. I don't think we really need to reschedule, she said. Can't I just tell you what he's like? An officious, dour-looking man squinted at her through the video screen. He seemed to buy that she was sick, but he wasn't going to be told no. Mrs. O'Donnell Nelson, I'm sorry, but that's not going to work. If you or your husband can't make your appointment tomorrow, then we'll have to reschedule. But... Greta wished she'd prepared better for this call. She just wasn't a good actor or improviser. Her excuses had never worked with her parents growing up, and she'd not improved since. But, well, we don't have to. He's a perfectly normal boy. I know all the signs of the disease, and he doesn't have any of them. He talks and responds to me on the first try. 
He's really social, too. He loves to play with other kids and stuff. He's fine. You don't need to bother to reschedule. And I believe you, Mrs. O'Donnell Nelson. But it's policy. Policy that I can't break. Every child must be tested. I understand, but... They're tested by professionals. These are people that spend their whole lives dealing with this situation. So they will spot things you might have missed. I understand, but... This time, Greta cut herself off. She knew it was hopeless. There could be no exceptions. It was working. Twenty years ago, nine out of ten children were born with the disease. Now it was already as low as five out of ten. The world couldn't afford to go back to the way it had been. What times are available, then? How about next Thursday at 4.20? That should work. She said, entering the time into her calendar. Thanks for being understanding. Greta disconnected the call, put her face in her hands, and sobbed. At least she'd gotten an extra week to prepare. She wouldn't be at that appointment. And much more importantly, neither would Bryson. Greta hugged Keith and gave him a peck on the cheek, then closed the door behind him as he headed out to catch his train. As soon as the door shut, Greta sprang into action. The duffel bag full of clothes she'd packed came out from under the bed. She brought up the box of food she'd loaded up from the cold storage room in the basement. She brought an ice chest to the refrigerator and shoved in everything she could possibly use. Then, in several trips, she took it out to the car shoving what would fit in the trunk, then putting the ice chest in the back next to Bryson's car seat. After a day of trolling across the underbelly of the internet, Greta felt like she'd found all the info she needed to pull this off. The real key was when she'd discovered the commune. In a remote area of eastern Montana, near Fort Peck Lake, there was a group of people who objected to the government's laws regarding euthanization for low functioners. After loading Bryson into his seat, she turned the key, engaging the engine, and pressed the pedal. She was off to join the objectors in Montana. Around the corner, she could see the square of sunlight that marked the exit to the parking garage. As she neared it, Keith stepped out from behind a pillar, stepped in front of the car, and held his hand out, palm up, forcing her to stop suddenly. Keith was stone-faced. He shook his head disappointedly and walked to Greta's window. I hoped it wouldn't come to this, Greta, but I knew it would. I just knew it would. Greta's stomach dropped. What are you doing here, Keith? You'll miss your train. You probably missed it already. You can drop the act, Greta. What are you talking about? I know where you're going. After the first time her stomach dropped, Greta thought it could drop no further. But this statement made it take a deeper dive. Of course you know. I'm taking Bryson to his appointment with the DHHS. Nice try, Greta. I know where you're really going, and I won't let you do it. You can't stop me. She rolled up her window, leaving only a crack open, and clicked the door locks. Greta, don't be silly. You'll be a criminal. The police will be out looking for you. And you'll have to do it all while trying to take care of a child that will never be able to take care of himself. You never loved him. You don't care about anything but yourself. I love Bryson, honey, but it doesn't matter. Love can't save him. Maybe if he was higher functioning, the DHHS would spare him. But he's not. If we make exceptions, then we'll be back to the same place we were 30 years ago. It was almost the end of the world back then. You can't stop me, Keith. There's a place for us, and we're going there. Right. The little commune? Greta flinched. Yeah. I looked at your web history. Keith went on. Do you really think you can make it to this commune if you can't even think ahead enough to delete your history? Greta looked down at her hands clenched on the steering wheel. She could still just turn the car around. Then a squawk from the back seat pulled her eyes to the rearview mirror. Bryson was sucking on his hands, contentedly in his chair. She had to do it. For him. You can't stop me, Keith. I'm going. I'm not going to try to stop you, Greta. I'm not interested in getting run over by a car, but I will call the police and report you. He pulled his phone from his pocket and his fingers deftly dialed the authorities. Greta stamped on the gas and tore out of the parking garage.
Greta stumbled weakly into the hidden camp. People emerged cautiously from the tents and the few wooden structures. Greta's foot caught a tree root, and she dropped heavily to the ground. She made certain to twist as she fell so that she landed on her backpack full of canned food rather than on the sling that contained her dearest baby, Bryson. Those emerging from the tents dropped their caution and rushed to her side. Lady, are you all right? Said a soft, fat, plain woman. I am now. I made it. She looked down at Bryson and smoothed his wispy hair down with a cracking, sunburned hand. We made it, Bryson. It's all going to be okay. What's your name, child? Asked the woman, voice warm and soothing. Greta. Greta O'Donnell Nelson. This is Camp Hope, right? That's right, said the woman. You've made it. Everything will be okay now. Then the woman turned to a much harder-looking man, holding a clipboard. O'Donnell Nelson. Is she on the list, then? The hard man didn't even look down. Yes, we've been waiting for her. Although it's been so long, we figured she'd died out in the woods by now. Greta couldn't understand what the two were saying. Had the man said he was waiting for her? How could that be? No one at the camp could have known that she was looking for them. Could they? It didn't make any sense, but her exhaustion wouldn't let her devote any concentration on the matter. She had run out of water two weeks ago, and resorted to drinking from streams, even though she knew they were teeming with Giardia. She simply couldn't go on without water. Of course, it didn't take long for the diarrhea to hit after that, which only left her more dehydrated and more exhausted. She had gamely pushed on, her beautiful baby Bryson deserving every last drop of strength she had. Now, she had finally made it to safety. Strong hands removed Bryson from the sling, and other strong hands helped her to her feet. An arm wrapped around her, and a man led her to a nearby canvas tent. The man placed her on a cot and wheeled an IV stand to her side. She tried to cry out when the needle pierced her arm, but found that she didn't even have the strength for that. Now that she'd finally reached her destination, her body had shut down. The moisture drained from the bag into her body, and Greta slipped slowly away into unconsciousness. The last thing she saw as she went was her husband Keith's face on a computer monitor. Mr. Nelson, said the man who had been helping her. We found her. Yes, she just arrived in camp. That didn't seem right. For a moment, Greta tried to understand what was happening. But Oblivion was calling, and she had to answer. Snow swirled outside, and the window was rhymed with a sheet of ice. Greta's home felt so empty now. Keith was there, as he had always been, but even a new paint job and walls full of bookshelves couldn't disguise the room that had once belonged to Bryson. Each time she passed it while walking down the hall, she felt grief tear at her heart anew, and she could never bring herself to actually enter the room. The house was peaceful and quiet, but the silence was overpowering to Greta. She couldn't accomplish anything because she couldn't concentrate through the din of silence. Yesterday, she'd had another appointment with the DHHS to determine if her mental state was acceptable to allow her to attempt pregnancy again. She'd done her best to seem well-adjusted, but she knew the doctor had seen through her charade. She'd certainly failed again. It didn't matter. She'd removed the IUD that the state had placed in her. It hadn't been easy but she'd managed to get it out without any damage to her reproductive system. The moment she confirmed that she was pregnant again, she'd be gone. And this time, she'd be somewhere so far away that Keith or even the DHHS couldn't touch her. South America sounded nice this time of year. back everybody thanks for uh waiting uh, you're slogging through that story of mine i hope you found something good in it okay we will do a cast list right sure 
Okay, so I read the story. Yes. I narrated the story. You were the voice of. I was the voice of nothing. I was the I voice. Was silence. Of... I was the din. Was the I was din. the din of the silence. That's yeah. Good. <laughs> okay, so with us today we have uh, Renee Chambliss, who was the voice of Greta. Yes. Yeah, we've had Renee Chambliss obviously on the show many times in the past, and you might know her from. Her many other things, just Dreaming of Deliverance, podcast novel. She won a Parsec Award for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine. Yeah. Yeah, you guys presented it to me. The first day of the conference. Our huge crowd. Yeah, yeah. Our first live story recording. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, also, uh, husband of Greta, Keith was played by Marshall Latham from the Journey Into podcast. Hello there. Welcome. Um, also jerk. the Star Wars Delusions of Grandeur podcast. Oh, oh yes, we don't want to miss that. And also the Strewn Along the Path podcast. I mean, this guy is just... I don't get greedy. He's everywhere. Um, the Dower Doctor was played by Brian Lincoln, who is also here. Hello. And yeah. we know Brian Lincoln from producing all of our Parsec Loser uh, exactly. podcasts. <laughs> uh, and from the Full Cast podcast, which won a Parsec. And from HG World. But uh, I do have this problem with all my different things to promote, so I just put it all in one place at lincolnaudio.com. I just call it Brian Lincoln Productions and call it a day. And that's so Lincoln Audio is where you can go to find it. So it's lincolnaudio.com? Yep. Should we link into that in the show notes? Is sure. it LinkedIn? <laughs> Should we ask everybody for their URLs? <laughs> <laughs> we'll put them in the I show gave notes. The office. We'll put them in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, you can find that in the show notes. Brian Lincoln from Brian Lincoln Productions? Lincoln yeah. Audio. It's, it's Brian Lincoln, Lincoln Productions, Productions, but I use Lincoln, Lincoln Audio. Lincoln Audio. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to make it less confusing. I'm not. <laughs> All right. And uh, then it's, we it's also. It's .ca. <laughs> oh, great, great. <laughs> it's .tv. <laughs> All right. And lastly, the hard man <laughs> who was at the end of the story. Played by our friend Johnny Feisty. The hard man at the end of the bed. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> so Johnny Feisty doesn't have a mic. Hi. Now I have a mic. Now you don't have one anymore because I took it back. What is your podcast called, Johnny Feisty? Um, my podcast is called TV Copilot, which I guess it was also nominated for a Parsec last year, but not a finalist. So uh, and we're in the process of season two going on right now. Is there a dash in copilot? No. So it's a one word copilot. Yes. TV space and then cop illa. Is <laughs> wash your copilot? I am a leaf on the wind. Nice. All right. So that's the uh, crew we've got uh, around the room this year. We had a few other people here with us uh, previously, but some people had to go earlier. Uh, then now uh, we're we're on the last night after the last night of the convention. So a couple of people who didn't have anything to do today hit the road. Abby is already gone. She was here with us earlier, and I think we recorded a bunch of stuff with. Would that be Abigail Hilton? Yeah, sorry, Abigail Hilton that from abigailhilton.com slash. I don't know what. Um, Panamandora.com. <laughs> the worlds of Abigail Hilton. Uh, and Dave Thompson of Podcastle was with us, uh -huh. and he uh, also recorded some stuff for us, too, and uh, that was the first time I'd met him. Yeah, and also Chris Lester was here with us. from oh, a piece of the results for Lester. That's right, from Metamore City. He was here with us uh, and was at Dune Steve Karaoke Night last night. But, uh, Woo! He's, he's already gone now already, so he doesn't get to participate in the after party. <laughs> All right, so uh, what are we going to talk about? Are we going to talk about NMX? Are we going to talk about story? Are we going to talk about both or nothing? Well, I wanted to talk a tiny bit about your story. 
And if people want to talk about the New Media Expo, that's great. But let me just start it off. Uh, last year we recorded one of my stories, and so it was only fair that we did yours this year, <clears throat> and several of mine anyway. Uh, <laughs> Both ending on a down note. That, in my experience, that's what life is, a series of down endings. All Jet I had was a bunch of Muppets. Your story, Through the Din of Silence, is something that you self-published, uh, the very, probably the first thing you ever self-published. Yeah, that's true, I guess. Uh, one day I'd written a story and I thought it would be interesting because I talk a lot about writing on my blog and on the show and so forth, and I thought it would be interesting to just put something out there that I had written to see what people thought and maybe get some feedback from them. And I put on the post, you know, this is only going to be here for a couple of weeks because I know... If you leave something up on the internet, a lot of places will say, okay, well, that's published already. I'm not going to pay for it and buy it from you or whatever. So it kind of kept it from being published that way, I guess. So I left it up for like two weeks, and then I went and deleted the post out. But uh, before I did that, several people were able to see it. You you were saying you saw it, Brian? Yeah, it was, it was very familiar when we were reading. I was like, I know I've seen this somewhere. I can't place it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I published it, and it was up there for a little while, and I got some comments and stuff. And then I took it down, and... I took what people had said and uh, applied it, and we, we found even some more errors while we were reading the story through that we circled so that I could fix those for later. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was a good experience. Sorry, was it those kinds of errors that the comments were about, or were they about... They were more about the subject matter of the story, really, because I did say that I was kind of a little nervous about the whole thing. Uh, and what people might think of it. Right. So you said you took, you, you based on those comments, you made some changes. I did. Did, did you make all the changes that were suggested or respond to all the comments? Or to them? Uh, that seemed tricky. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I decided based on what people had said to make a particular change mm -hmm. with it. Um, but I didn't, yeah, I mean, I think somebody did point out a, a typo that I fixed, but they, I, obviously we found more. But uh, Well, one change that I have noticed is the A word is absent. That's right. Yeah, yeah that was one of the changes that I uh, I picked. Should we, should I give the... Yeah, give us the background of, of why you wrote this story. Okay, we did a, you know, I work in the news, so I, I've said that before, and one day at work we ran a story about about autism and its frequency or something like that and where i live is a particularly high frequency of autism and it was something like one in 49 children or it was a really high number for something like that have autism and i thought one in 49 really that seems like a lot and it seems like to me when i was younger you know the first time i'd ever heard of autism was when the movie rain man came out and I, I was like, oh, this is one of those, uh, you know, movies about some strange disease that you hardly know anything about kind of thing. Because sometimes you get those, like, what was that one with Robert De Niro in it? Well, it was about the people that just went into a coma. Awakenings, yeah. So I, I associated those two movies together as, you know, some kind of an unusual, very rare disease, you know, because I'd never met or heard of anyone that had this but since then that has changed substantially i know it may have been just that i was a kid and i just didn't know anything and that's why i'd never heard of anything like that but uh, it seems like it's become more and more and more and more and more common but is that not what the news report said the news report said 20 years ago x was the number of autism cases reported correct yeah, it, w it I'm not. I can't remember exactly, but it was that was what I was thinking anyway at the time. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Um, but yeah, it, the frequency of it had increased substantially, and I know a lot of people say that it may not have actually increased. It may just be that they classify different things that used to not be classified as autism are now part of the autism spectrum disorders. And so it may not be increasing as at such an alarming rate as I was thinking at the time when I saw this. But the idea came to me with that, if autism is increasing at that rate, what would it be like 
you know, 100, 150 years in the future when suddenly, you know, at one point in the story, the guy says that there was nine out of 10 children were born with autism. And what would people do? You know, we right now, I mean, it's, it's almost, see, that was the thing I was really afraid of. It's like taboo to even consider something like that. To, uh, to, to, you know, consider what would you do if you were in that kind of a situation. That's why I worried what people would think. And so I did take the A word out and just put in the disease or the yeah, condition or whatever, whenever something like that came up, just to avoid. Was, was that, that the specific, the specific suggestion, suggestion that you got? From? No, it wasn't a specific suggestion. People did say, oh, well, you might. I asked if people thought it could be offensive. And some people said, well, maybe, and then, you know, so I, I tried to avoid it just so that I, you know, people could hear it without thinking that I'm advocating euthanizing autistic people, which of course I'm not. I mean, it's a science fiction story, but that's not going to keep people from being offended all the same. Well, or people planting a flag just because they have their own axe to grind and they'll use your story as a springboard for that. Right. So the argument is that there are just too many to care for, possibly, so you have to... Right, yeah, it was basically what I was thinking is, what if it got to the point where there was just, there would be no one to take care of day-to-day -day things that people have to do. There would be no one to work on a farm, or no one to, you know, be a policeman or anything like that, because if 9 out of 10 children were autistic and they couldn't care for themselves, then everyone would have to be involved in caring for these children so you know the society would be just you know groaning under the weight of this pressure until it finally snapped and it would fall apart i would think i don't know it was just kind of what i got to anyway well i think that there is uh, scientific evidence that all this autism is caused by vaccinations if there were a scientist in the room he would back me up on this because i i saw that's right and and maybe the, the rate of autism is really decreasing now because Jenny came out recently to say her kid was actually not autistic, they discovered. Oh. So that whole thing was to find someone else to blame for her kid's autism, which she chose vaccines, and her kid was never autistic. Well, and it wasn't even that, but she claimed that what she was doing had cured him. Right. So, e cigarettes. Um, <laughs> what? E-cigarettes? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I was hoping it was breastfeeding a 13-year-old with <laughs> autism. <laughs> but, uh, but so, yeah, she was saying, you know, you don't need to forget all this medical mumbo-jumbo. You know, what I have done is cured my kid, and, you know, he never had it to begin with. He had some other, like, really rare condition. Sorry, I purposely derailed the conversation. <laughs> um, well, a year from now, well, might not be you voiced a joke that I was. <laughs> oh, you were reaching to gonna, do it. Okay, I wanted well. to bring Jenny into it somehow. So. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> but, but Brian, do you know anything about autism and why the numbers would be going up? Do you think that maybe a kid, when Big and I went to school, would have just been classified as an asshole, and then um, <laughs> in the 21st century is like, no, no, this boy is autistic. I don't know that we know the cause. I definitely think the rate is increased, but probably a lot of the increase is understanding it more. Um, I know a few people who either are adults who are or have kids who are, and seeing their behavior is radically different. It, it's very hard to get their attention. They're focused. They're, they're living in their own world. They just don't have the social interaction. And my guess is that it could have something to do with you know, child development is somehow being an affected, affected in a way we don't understand that makes this more likely to occur. And I have no idea if that happens in the womb at a certain stage or if it's just, you know, blame McDonald's. <laughs> I don't know. But well, I, but let's blame the, McDonald's because... You know, it could be the food that's... It, it, it could be anything. And it's really, to be a scientist, it's really uh, a bad thing to just guess. So we just don't know is the right way to respond to that. But we do know that there's no correlation with vaccines whatsoever, and that's just a scapegoat. So, it, And it's a, it's a dangerous thing to not give vaccines because vaccines are very important for what's called herd immunity, which really means that if not enough people are able to spread the thing, it won't be able to spread and, and potentially infect enough people. But when too many children and, and kids are the ones that are really hurt by not having vaccines they can die from things that other people would survive. Right. So you have a lot more young deaths because of a lack of herd immunity.
Right, yeah. Even something we always talk about on the news is the, uh, I want to say it's the whooping cough virus, which is the, the dip, yeah, pertussis diphtheria in tetanus. All go in one. DPT. And, and you're DTAP. DTAP? I think that's what they call it. Anyways, you're supposed to still get it. Every 10 years, you're supposed to get a booster. And even if you got it as an adult, it probably wouldn't hurt you much. But poor kids will get messed up by it. People are very afraid of vaccines because they think you're getting a little version of the disease. But that's that's not how it works. You're teaching your system to build an, um, an immunity to a certain kind of, a certain kind of receptor a certain kind of antibody needs to be produced and it needs to see the thing to produce it against the you always see these pictures in in the science of like a little carrot of different sizes and they have to match up in order for the thing to be blocked and what you can do is they can easily engineer dead ones you know or just use dead ones or engineer fake ones that have the same little thing to train your immune system uh, and you're not being given like the disease itself in a, right. in, in a fightable way. It's not a threat whatsoever. Right. You still can have a reaction and get feel a little sick from it, but that's just your body's immune system turning on. That's why autoimmune diseases are so dangerous because that's your body fighting itself. That's one of the scariest things you can get. Right. Well, yeah, I think we can all agree that the best thing you can do for a child is to buy the little Einstein videos for when they're first born, which brings me to our sponsor this week. Now a word from our sponsor. Sorry. <laughs> I think Big was right. Thank you. Announcer, the ghost of announcer, man. <laughs> so you dropped the word autistic from the story. I did. But nobody asked you to do that. It was for just self-censorship? Yeah, I just thought it would be wise to uh, see if we could avoid... I mean, all, all the rest of it is still there. I mentioned, you know, low functioning and high functioning and, and that kind of stuff. So if you really wanted to figure it out, if you can figure it out. What is the word autistic in question? Is that, is that becoming like the R word and something? That, hey, we're not going to use that word. No, no, it's not a bad word in any way. It's just I didn't want people to be offended in thinking, oh, this guy advocates that we should kill my child. You know, because... People can get upset. I mean, no, we no, ran no. a story about cats once on our show. Indeed, we did. And you would not believe the reaction we got about it. Say, I, hold on, let me interrupt. I choose to believe we ran a story about dogs on our show. <laughs> So sometimes people get upset even though, you know, it's fiction, it's set in the future, it's just an idea. It's not supposed to be advocating anything, it's just a what if is all it's supposed to be. And I didn't want anyone to get upset, so I thought I'd try and soften it a little further. I don't think it was necessary to spell it out. I mean, this kind of makes it more sort of a universal issue. I mean, maybe it's some other kind of condition. Right. You know, it could be anything, but that's not really, that doesn't really matter for the story, what specifically it is. Just the, right. Yeah. Big, is this a story that you would not have written if you didn't have kids yourself? It may have been different. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I would have written something on it. Just the idea of that, you know, the the numbers increasing so rapidly and what would happen if they got to the point where they were beyond sustainability is was interesting to me. So I probably would have done something with it. It may not have been that same way where it was a mother and her child and, you know, trying to save the child. And, and stay, I, mean, I don't know what I would have come up with, but... I probably would have still written something on it, I think. One thing I was curious about was whether Greta's, you know, reactions and sort of inclinations about all of this was unusual in their society. Like, because you would think that could be something that, you know, all mothers would be dealing with when they're coming up to that point. Mm -hmm. So was she out of the ordinary for how she felt and what she did? Or was that something that, you know, every, most women, most mothers had to... I think that she, I wouldn't say she was out of the ordinary. I'm sure all of them have to, I mean, obviously, they're going to have to deal with it somewhat. I think taking it to the level that she took it to was probably, you know, I think most people, I mean, it, it's been, what do you say, 30 years, I think, at one point that they've had, had to do this. So people have gotten 
I'm sure, quite used to it. Keith's reaction was maybe the more typical. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And Keith is obviously, you know, he's city councilman, so he wants to be the exemplar and all that stuff. And probably purposely detached himself from feeling. Yeah, I think that's probably where the, most of the people would be at this point. They just wouldn't bond. Right? Yeah, they would like avoid bonding with children until they're past the, the time that, the, you know, they, they're safe. It's probably something that could, I don't know, maybe it wouldn't even be possible to happen that they could ever take such a severe step. I mean, if you've got nine out of ten kids, you would have to do something because you can't just have, you know, that small of the population <laughs> right. managing it all. I mean, I just don't, I guess maybe, I, I don't really see how it would work. So I could see that happening. I mean, you know, cultures have made pretty drastic decisions before China, you know, when you can only have one child, right. that kind of thing. I mean, it's not as drastic as this. Right, <laughs> but, but still, you know, sometimes you have to do drastic things to survive. Well, you could sell them to Amazon. Someone's got to control those drones that are going to fly. Oh, there you, go, there you go. And just let them do that until they pass out of exhaustion. Well, if this story was Jeez. this story was not a lot of fun, but the fun <laughs> of a story like this is asking, well, what would I do? Right, and, and I, I, I would imagine, Renee, since you were Greta, it, it, you were the one that felt the most of this is me, and what would I do if this were my boy? And well, yeah, I and mean, that's why I asked the question, because of course, like, yeah, <laughs> that's what, you know, as a mother, that's what you do, is you protect your children, so I can't imagine not reacting that way, and I thought it was especially sad and touching, because she's just wanting to, you know, shower him with affection, and that's not something that, you know, he was really responding to, but she still had those feelings. And, and ha having not read it ahead of time, you're disappointed that she didn't actually get to I the was. commune. <laughs> I found out that it was fake, the commune. <laughs> well, uh, you mentioned China, and stop me if I shouldn't say this, but you hear all the time about the undesirability of a female child in China. But, but that's that's got to be a, the, some people feel this way. It can't be all, all of them are just like, oh shit, we had a girl. Right? I mean, there, 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 are, there, are, there have to be Chinese parents that are like, I'm glad we had a girl. She's awesome. She's great, you know, kind of thing. But if society shouts enough times that girls are bad, oh, what, there's dishonor in having a girl, eventually people would start to believe. They would convince themselves, or maybe from the moment they're born, they're like, crap, it was a girl. I failed you, honey. Right? I, I'm just trying to think of... If, if things continued the way that, they, that they're going in this society with the autistic children, maybe you get to the point where you don't even name your kid until he's had this test. And you're like, you know, I, I would rather not hold him. I would rather not get attached to him in any way until I have a stamp of approval that this kid is mine, if you will, that I'm, I'm going to be able to see this kid grow up and stuff. You would insulate yourself, or some would, not all, so I guess I was trying to play devil's advocate a little bit of how uh, how someone could convince well, himself. And then at that point, if a child has grown up with nobody trying to bond with it emotionally for 10 years, <laughs> what kind of a civilization are you going to create? Yeah, so you're well, saying that we're inspiring autism in some of these children because well, we're just like, no, I can't love that kid or the it's uh, weird. The, the solution to one problem is it's just going to cause another problem. Yeah, yeah, if nobody bonds with their children, then they're going to be pretty messed up uh, emotionally. Well, I was saying before, like, do, it, does it does it occur during fetal development, or does it is it something that is caused by their very early childhood after they're born? I mean, it could be. <laughs> yeah, there you that, go. That it's a combination because usually it is like how how things develop to a certain degree. It's the nature and nurture type of thing. Well, I thought one of the theories was that it was a genetic thing. And that's why, like, they have these concentrations, like in the Silicon Valley and stuff like that, you know, um, of people who have the more tendency to kind of focus on, th you know, at the one end of the spectrum, having kids. And so, you know, if that's the case, then I guess by employing this practice, 
it's sort of evolution in a way, you know, you're not allowing those people to pass their genes on, and so they're not, there won't be as many. And big on that news story that you saw, there were no speculations as to what was caused. I mean, were these women that were having children in their 40s that tended to have more autistic children? There's, were these women that had 15 kids and 14 and 15 were always autistic? Or No, there is always speculation as to what is causing it. There's all sorts of things. People are like, uh, is it air pollution that, you know, is, be, is causing the problem in pregnant women breathing the air pollution and then their babies? There's, I'm sure as many ideas about it as there are people looking into it. Um, the story itself was just, here are the numbers. Here's what the numbers used to be. Was basically, and we get a lot of stories that are like that. <laughs> here are the numbers of this. Well, is it because this is going to scare people? And we want people to watch the news because bad news is always worse than good news? I well, that's why would you present a problem but give no evidence about it? You don't tie a, a bow on it at all and say, but you know, scientists are working hard to solve this problem. Well, they might say that, yeah, scientists are look, people are trying to discover or whatever, but it's not news's job to tell a story as far as with a beginning, middle, and end. We say, this happened today, this came out today, this here it is. And uh, the rest of it has to be, you know, it's not, it's news, not uh, cinema or, you know, Document. literature or anything like that. We, we're just presenting it. And with something like this, there is no whole story to tell. You know, I mean, yeah, scientists are looking into it as the best you can say. And maybe a hundred years from now, we'll know. And it'll be like polio or something where we can just say, oh, yeah, and we got this vaccine and it's basically eliminated but you know for now it's a problem that we're going to be dealing with i'm sure for a while so in, in the case of this story they have to reach a certain age and then there's a test right right so my expectation if this kind of future revealed itself and it, it, if there are clear genetic markers at least for a strong propensity i would have an expectation that they would even in fetus they would try to determine which ones were likely and just like that's, that's them but, earlier on. but that's kind of a scary because that means that you'd have like research proposals that are directed toward developing more efficient euthanasia. So how do you you know there's a very big question in terms of just morality there. Or you could, I mean, providing this is the future, you could do fetal genetic therapy. I mean, there are sure. things that they could be doing also to mitigate that in utero. Yeah, and then what is the is it that much better? I mean, you're still taking the child. I mean, you haven't had the years of seeing it grow up, but it still sucks. Yeah. Yeah, there's no good time for something like that to happen. Well, for okay. sure. How old was Bryson? Um, 25. 25. <laughs> he was... Come on, Bryson. I was thinking probably around two, but I don't know. I mean, I... I the ex black. Yeah, the extent of my research was like reading some Wikipedia stuff about <laughs> autism and no, trying well, and, to and discover. And a science fiction story doesn't have to be scientifically. Yeah, just trying to discover what autism. age they're at, more or less, when you know you can tell one way or another. Well, maybe this is all getting too grim, but um, the, <laughs> <laughs> the the discussion of like gen testing the gene. I mean, my understanding is you have the whole spectrum and can you tell by the genes sort of at what point on the spectrum? Yeah, there's that be. too. And then there's also this, you know, I gather that there is a movement of people who are functioning in society, but maybe their brains you know, work this way, saying, look, the way I think and the way I perceive the world and the way I relate, there are benefits to that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm happy this way, this is, this isn't a problem for me, so, you know, I don't think I should be euthanized, <laughs> you know. But a two-year-old like, can't make that argument. Exactly, no, they can't. And I don't know. I mean, if you, we always have read short stories where people eventually expanded them into novels. If you were to expand this one, there would be a lot of areas where you can expand. I mean, you could have an entire chapter that's just the test that the kid has to take, and the 
maybe the hoops they make them jump through and the, you know all that stuff it, the, just the different thoughts of, of you look at an actual list of symptoms would you say okay that actual that they classify in autism and say okay so how would you determine in a two-year-old whether they had this and this and this and this and and then yeah uh, just how society got to this point and what happens to the ones that get euthanized you know where are they taken and what is done and 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 would that be something that everybody knows is that common knowledge or would that be something that people don't want to know they don't want to think about that we don't want to see how the sausage is made so to speak i'm not saying what <laughs> What becomes of the children? <laughs> but I mean, it's just there's so many aspects of a story like this where you can expand if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, there definitely is. Yeah, not to be too grim, but I, I've known someone who's ex who's been forced to to have this happen. Um, I, when I was a postdoc uh, grad student, sorry, in Germany, getting my PhD, there was a Chinese girl who was also a grad student there, and she had a kid and the husband that were back in China, and he came and visited her one time, and she got pregnant again um, while she was at the lab. And she, I think, now I didn't, I, I wasn't, I was hearing this from my coworkers who worked directly on different stuff with her, so I didn't, obviously she's not gonna have this conversation with, with very many people, but what I had heard was that she had held onto the hope for a while that because it had happened there that she would be able to somehow get around the system. And at some point, she was forced to fly back to China and have the abortion against wow. her will. It was rough. And, and she's a very quiet, well-spoken, just really nice person. And I, you, it was not something she wanted to do. So, hmm. I mean, it's, scare, it's scary. That this kind of stuff can't really happen. So it's not that far-fetched of an idea when society makes these rules. It, yeah. You would think that since she was out of the country, maybe she could at least... If she wanted, you know, have the baby, then yeah. put it up for adoption or something. Because then, I don't know, that's interesting. Sorry to bring the uh, room down. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for bringing the room down. Should we change the subject from, uh, you know, what is it, eugenics? What, is, what do they call that? Euthanasia. The, I mean, euth <laughs> Euthanasia? <laughs> that's pretty good. I was thinking maybe we were getting into a really dark version of one of uh, Rish's barbecue sketches or something. <laughs> one, one up well, each other. Yeah. Well, I, not to get too grim, but... We ate our kid. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> We're talking about how detached they are from their, their children. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't even ever pick my kid up. And it's like, I, I, I keep blinders on. I've never looked directly at my child. <laughs> and now, a word from our sponsor... Hey there, can I help you? Shh, I have a baby stapled to my abdomen for some reason, and it is sleeping. Sorry, you called your baby it? Can you tell me about cell phone plans, but in an exaggerated whisper, please? Why would you bring a baby to a store like this? The voices told me to do it. We need a new family smartphone plan. Your family? Just me and the baby. Why would your baby need a smartphone plan? Because every customer in these commercials is a complete idiot. Haven't you ever watched them? No. I'm too busy listening to the Fullcast podcast, hosted by the dreamy Brian Lincoln. What's a Fullcast? So, we have a great deal right now on family data plans. Shh! I have a sleeping baby! That's a really ugly baby. I can tell it's yours. What? We're whispering about cell phones. How about 10 gigs of data to share and unlimited talk and text? Wow, 10 gigs sounds really good. Yeah, and for your family, it's 160 for four lines. What? Get out of here! Excuse me, I was... Shh! My baby's asleep. You know... I hope something happens to your baby, like it gets carried away by giant ants, or sees you killed by hillbillies and grows up to become a serial killer like Dexter Morgan on that show. I thought you said you didn't watch TV. That's on Showtime. They don't have commercials. Shh. My baby's asleep. Right. Anyway, there's an unlimited data plan, and I'm sorry I said I hope your child sees you murdered. No problem. 
I actually really hope your baby murders you with fire or needles or a diaper genie. You can't talk to me in that tone, young lady. Are we still doing the whispering thing, or... I don't know. This isn't even a real baby. It's a shaved monkey. You're sick, you know that? I, I call the monkey Larby. I'm calling security. The monkey isn't sleeping either. It's dead. Guess that makes it all right, then. I'm gonna go bother Flo and the progressive insurance commercials now. Please do, sir. Shh. I just soiled myself. Introducing our best ever family pricing. For instance, a family of four gets 10 gigs of data with unlimited talk and text for $160 a month, only from AT&T. All right, so we're going to change the grim subject away from my grim story. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about some fun stuff now. Uh, we're here at New Media Expo. Again, this is our second year doing this. This year was a little different than last year. Last year, I think we were almost like an afterthought to New Media Expo. I think each of us maybe had one panel. How many panels did we have all together? Two. Like two? Just two. Two panels, and the half of us were in one, half of us were in the other. And uh, we had almost nobody in both of our panels. Attending, um, you mean? Yeah, sorry. Almost no one in the audience for both of our panels. There was, I think, one or two people for each one. Plus the other people that were here with us that weren't on that panel at that time. This year was a little different. We had a lot more panels to begin with. The first day that we were here, I was in live story reading, then a panel, and then another panel immediately after that. Three panels in the first day, which is already three times as much <laughs> the whole last year. And then I still had two more to do of the story readings, and I think all of us had probably at least two panels or more that we were in. So it was a much more involved thing this year. I found myself worn out after that first day. I was doing three panels the first day, and I was just like, okay, let's all sit down and stare at the wall for a while, okay? Uh, how, what did you guys think of the experience? Or did I make it too grim again? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I didn't have to do much work. I just got to perform, and oh, I was—I thought it was great that they wanted us on so many panels, and and some of the panels were actually well attended. Which yeah, was really that's neat. one thing. I, I I tried hard with the panel that I suggested to make it something that would apply beyond just our group, beyond just podcast fiction stuff. Yeah, that was what we tried to do. The exception, I guess, of the live story reading, those were supposed to be kind of a, you know, fun for us to do, but also maybe if someone wanted to change the pace from going to these sessions, they could go and see those stories. So uh -huh. I'm not sure it really worked out that way. Yeah, but, um, they were the other, less attended, yeah, unfortunately. The other sessions we did, we tried to make them things that we knew about, but that would work for people who weren't podcast fiction people, because... But, you know, 99% of the people here are not podcasters. Yeah. There's pod, plenty of podcasters, but not necessarily podcast fiction people. And so we try. yeah, I tried really hard to do that. And I, we had a pretty good, pretty good crowd in the one that I came up with. You did an ACX one that had a gigantic crowd, probably the biggest crowd of all the ones that we were involved with. And so yeah, I was, I was impressed with the turnout, at least. I was relieved at <laughs> the turnout. <laughs> <laughs> invited these people to come and speak at it and uh, it would have been good to have them come all the way out and not have people there but I I expected that that ACX session would be well attended by the new media expo attendees just because it dovetailed right into what they're trying to do which is you know earn a living through new media and, you know, that's, and I think a lot of podcasters don't know about ACX did I explain what ACX is Sure, go ahead real quick. And and after that, I think Johnny should talk, because I think he was one of those people that kind of learned about it. In, in this oh, okay. It's uh, Audible's audiobook creation exchange, and it basically is sort of matchmaking between narrators and, and producers, people who can make audiobooks, and people who have audiobook rights to, usually it's authors have the rights to their own book, but sometimes it's publishers. And it's just a place where those people can find each other and agree to have audiobooks. If someone wants to get into narrating and audiobook production, it's a good place to start. They're just 
it's easy to break into. There aren't big gatekeepers there like there are with the audiobook publishers. So I thought the podcasters here at New Media Expo would like to know about it, and a lot of them seemed to yeah, I'm one of those podcasters who was looking for this type of session. I mean, this is my second year at New Media Expo, and uh, last year I didn't find a whole lot of practical information on the things. Like, we, there's a lot of promise of here are things you can do, like you, know, you do one, two, three, and you get this result, and that's not what happens with podcasting. It's not a career that you sign up as like a, you know a new enlistee and you go up some sort of a ladder to do anything that's expected. And so the ACX session was really good because, and I looked for this kind of stuff actively, I wasn't really aware of the program, and it's a, you know exactly the type of thing I'm looking for. It was nice to actually have something where you could see an avenue towards something you can actually apply towards, you know, like make an effort toward doing something other than like, you know, here's how to set up like your blog for getting people to click for you to get advertiser dollars and all sorts of hokum that you hear strong, but... Hopefully, you know, NMX isn't auditing your podcast. But, uh, yeah, it was great because, uh, I, you know, I'm in the position of trying to transition into a career in, I guess, you know, anything that falls under the umbrella of new media. And, it's, and it was one of the by far most useful things, you know, that I've seen in two years now of going to sessions. Well, good. I'm glad. And then the advanced audiobook panel was also very well attended. That was Brian and Chris Lester's. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a nerd fest going on in there. There's all these guys, and they're like, oh, yeah, and they were spouting mumbo jumbo, like wall of sound and this frequency, and it was amazing in there. Brian had, uh, he'd set up like a, a full on demonstration. He even had his record stuff the night before that he could edit live in front of them. Yeah, which I probably should have made that part really short and then had just switched to the final because I, I felt like I, it took a little while to do and maybe it, it got that across but I, I was I was basically just showing some very basic equalization and and compression and noise reduction on voice tracks and then doing a little bit of reverb stuff um, but it was a little bit tough because when I was after I recorded it with everyone the night before um, I had sat down with the computer and listened through and found that I had very clear noise to reduce. It was great. And then I went and played the raw sound in that room with the speakers way up in the ceiling and you couldn't really hear the noise. And I was like, oh, I'll just tell them that I'm going to reduce the noise this way and just not do keep doing before and after because they're not going to hear the difference. I was like, I didn't really take into account the vast difference in acoustics in that room from... Well, yeah. Bad. We were, were you guys in Big and Rich's session on, um, you know, podcasting budget on a budget uh -huh. you know, all the talk about good sound quality and all the things you could do and the sound quality in that room was so <laughs> horrible <Yeah. laughs> it was kind of ironic but i mean they i think they got the point they the, first of all i think they laughed at this the skit yeah which i wasn't sure if that was going to be awkward or funny <laughs> and secondly uh, i think they at least really got the reverb yeah. down and the way the reverb faded out i saw some people go oh and because they could hear almost like as the reverb went down, I hit the right angle because as you came out of the cave, the voices suddenly got clear and it sounded with the birds chirping like they just walked, like it could have been recorded that way outside. So at least that's how it sounded to me from behind the, yeah. the thing. So I thought that, that some people were like, oh yeah, that was really quick and really cool. And I heard just a, a raw recording turn into sound like the environment a little bit. Uh, and then we just moved on from there. But well, I think the cool thing about that too was you were pretty much put away the slides. Yeah. And uh, we're showing them actually what you were doing. And when, as we listened to the reverb fade out, we saw the slope of the line that where you had done that on the. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, for me, in terms of learning audio production, a lot of it is just playing around. But the initial step is just a blank screen. And just to see someone moving things around a little bit might be all you need to get the confidence to start playing yourself. But until you've seen like the stupidest most simple things done you're you're just not sure if you're doing it right and then once you do it then it's great so i i, I prefer something that demonstrates especially with audio demonstrates an effect even if it has to be a quick simple one as opposed to a bullet point list of this is how what the best settings are for a reverb situation and, no, that's great. And so. Yeah, it's not what you really get generally for these kind of things too. You know, they'll give you 
ideas, but an actual practical sit down here and look, we're going to do this and look at them doing it. Here it goes. It, it was a good, cool change from what you would normally get. Um, so yeah, that was our... The sessions, but there were other things. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That was our, our time in the actual conference itself. But one of our favorite things about New Media Expo is not necessarily the conference itself, but the opportunity to come and get together with all the, the folks that we work with all year long, but don't actually see or know. I remember last year, you know, the first time I, you know, walked in and, and actually saw, you know, Renee talking and heard her voice at the same time. It was an amazing thing for me. It was, you know, the same kind of thing with Brian and Marshall and all that, you know, you hearing their voices, you've, I've heard their voices hundreds of times, but actually seeing them at the same time, it's a, it was a weird, kind of a weird experience. Obviously, it's not that way this time around because it's not the first time anymore. It's it's getting back together. But it's awesome to be able to get together these people that we've, you know, worked with and stuff, but never actually been able to meet. And so it's, fun, it's really fun to be here with the people and to do things. And... Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're starting up some traditions here, uh, apparently. Yeah, we, we, we went and did karaoke again. We, we went to Denny's again, yeah. <laughs> we, wa we got lost on the strip again, which has become a tradition. Uh, walking up and down very, very far on the, the Las Vegas Strip. We actively, actively don't, don't let, let Renee, Renee come with us for pizza. No, That's I, right. Well, I just won't go to the pizza. Yeah, we had Dune Steve pizza night, and Renee once again oh, boycotted I it. Um, strong objections to it. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised that we were able to find the same restaurant. It was really weird. We drove down the street, and I was like, whoa, it's right here. We, we thought it was like way out there somewhere, but it was really close and easy. To, we'll probably be able to find it again next year, too, now. Yeah, some fun and interesting things happened, I think, while we were... What, what would you say will open up the floor here? Whoever wants to talk, I'd tell a funny story, whatever. I'll, I'll tell that. We were on the Strip the very first night, and there are all these people... We talked about it last year. There are these people whose jobs it is to flip these little uh, escort pieces of cardboard at you are they magnets what are i don't I know what they are the but they're like cards. escort service or strip club papers or something like that and they'll flip those at you and they, but then there will also be people there that are just there of their own accord a lot of times in costumes i, I think there are some panhandlers you know they're wanting a handout but there was one guy and he had a sign on his shirt that said kick me in the nuts twenty dollars and I was like, big, look, check that out. Look at that guy's sign. And as we walked by, he said, who has the balls to kick me in the balls? <laughs> Just the, the idea of that. You know, I had paid $20 to see somebody kick that guy in the nuts. But... <laughs> Yeah, and it was like we, on cardboard, you know, written yeah. with a Sharpie. So you wonder, like, was this his first night? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what would, you know, maybe it was it a success? Yeah. What, what would he call he a successful a night? Yeah. It's, it's his first and his first last. Honey, it's like a single <laughs> dollar tonight. We'll celebrate with me. It's, is it a success that nobody gave him twenty bucks, or is it a success that he came home with? A, I don't know. I made twenty dollars and I regret it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The sad thing is, Rish ran through all our listener donations trying to get this guy to fall down. and <laughs> He was strong, or I am very weak. I don't know. Yeah. The angle was off. You need to, more soccer skills. Did you ask him to like, like, turn, turn around, around or anything? Or anything? <laughs> no. I, actually, we didn't approach him. And in retrospect, we should have given him a couple of bucks to pose in a picture. Like we're in mid-kick, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, I, it, it was just so strange. Yeah. And he was kind of a loud mouth. Yeah, he wasn't just standing And I there thought, time. that's got to be an act to get more people to, to want to hurt this guy. But it's just, I had never seen that before. Yeah, that was very weird. It's, I guess it's like a dunk tank or whatever, the guy mocking you. And he's like, hey, you can't knock me off this thing. Taken to the, the furthest degree <laughs> so far. Um, I was going to say, I, I hear tell that 
Las Vegas was introduced to a new celebrity as well. You could say that. We, uh, we had our... <laughs> was it David H. Lawrence? That <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, we had our karaoke night, which we do every year now, twice. This is two years, so we do it every year. But we were pretty excited because this year we knew where to go. Last year I, I, we had an idea that there was a place that did karaoke and we wandered around looking for it. We never did find it, um, and, t- and it was super late before we ever did find a place that did karaoke all days of the week, because I think that was our problem last year. It was like Wednesday or something like that, or Wednesday. Tuesday. Wish knew about a place. That's what, weren't we trying to find the place that you knew about? And yeah, we couldn't find it. We went, and we walked here and there, and then finally somebody told us where to go, and we went it, to it that. that. The place that where we ended up wasn't the place that... No, we went to the Ellis Island this year and last year, but there had been a casino that we came to that had like a whole section for karaoke, and I and I loved it. You know, there were slot machines and crabs tables and that, and then a, a square that was all karaoke. But no, we didn't find that. Yeah, was, was it the was a good one. Smoke free. <laughs> <laughs> that would be neat. I I always said when I own a casino, I'm going to have the first non-smoking casino just to see if the clientele improves you know yeah you should get right on that i don't i don't think it's a big startup cost or anything for a casino. but yeah i think the problem was that it was just a non-weekend last year and because we walked through i, th- I want to say it was a new year oh that that's another thing we did we went on the roller coaster i guess we'll talk about that at some point but when we were at the new york new york cas- casino there was karaoke going on in one of the bars there as we walked past so happens just wasn't happening that night but we didn't know for sure every night of the week ellis island did karaoke so we figured we would go there again and uh usually it's our last night which would be tonight that we do that last year we did it that way but there were some people leaving early and they didn't want to miss out on the karaoke so we all went yesterday and yeah it was fun we uh we all had took our turn renee again surprised us with her song choice (laughs) <laughs> Last year, all of a sudden, she's singing La Bamba up there. And we're just like, what the? This year, she gets up there and sings Bad to the Bone. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Yeah. People listening don't get to see what Renee looks like, but they hear her voice. And just imagine a person with that voice trying to pull off Bad to the Bone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. Totally pulling off Bad to the it. Bone. Yeah, high five. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a good the choice. The crowd was, was into a, it. That was a good it was a fun time. I'll have to admit, I sang "Pour Some Sugar on Me," yeah. which that was weird because I've never actually seen the words to that song. I mean, I've heard it a thousand times. It's got to be one of those songs where people just make up whatever they think it says. Uh, I, I, it might be fun to get like five people in a room and try and have them write down what they think the words yeah, are no to that close song. Because I doubt you. Can, yeah. Almost the whole way through, be all different. Yeah, I, it's a song about bubbles, apparently. Yeah, yeah there's bubbles, bubbles like in there. Bubbles. <laughs> Bubble is one of the words, and yeah, there was a lot of strange things in there, and I was hearing about them for the first time as I tried to sing them, which was surprising to me because I've heard this song a bazillion times in my life, and and uh, yeah, and Rich did a couple of songs. Marshall did the. Eastbound and down. Eastbound and down, loaded up and trucking. <laughs> that's the Smokey, Smokey and the Bandit. Smokey and uh, the Bandit. Yeah. Song. I was thinking I should have should have tried Renee's trick and done you know like Bark at the Moon by Ozzy yeah. Osbourne or something like that. That would have been nice. I'd like to see you do Bark at the Moon. <laughs> Brian didn't actually get up, but he did duet with Big on Master, it's Master. <laughs> Master of yeah, I actually considered doing that as my second song, Master of Puppets, and then somebody got up ahead of me and did it, and I, it's probably a good thing that I didn't, because I didn't consider the fact that there's like several very, very long instrumental breaks in the middle. Of, one of them was... You don't do karaoke regularly. That's like something that you really need to know about. Like, yeah. What's the instrumental break situation and do yeah. you have a plan for what you're going to do? Exactly. During- there was some that were like a minute, it was like a minute 50, I think, somewhere in the, just in the middle of the song where it was just all instrumental break. This guy got up and he banged his head and went nuts on it. But yeah, me and Brian were singing 
trying to, almost as loud as he was yeah. just from the, the table we were sitting at. Yeah, I wasn't too surprised that Brian sang along to that. But the one that surprised me was the Godier song that ah. <laughs> oh. he knew. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't the type of music I thought Brian liked, but he knew. Yeah, Brian Lincoln, just to give you the, the idea of what music he prefers, the mayor of the town in the uh, the story that he edited for us, which was called The Ever-Dreaming, the Ever-Dreaming Verdict of Plagues, was played by the lead singer of the band November's Doom. So you can look up November's Doom, and uh, that's the kind of stuff that Brian really enjoys. Yeah. <laughs> Check it out. You may have found a kindred spirit or as far from a kindred spirit. <laughs> it's one of those kind of styles of music that you either love or you hate, usually. But uh, I really like November's Doom's Carpenter's Covers album, though. It, song, it actually improved on a couple of those. But yeah, Rish also sang a couple of songs. And then it got to the point where some people needed to go home. And so I got in the car. Abby needed to go early in the morning to uh, catch a plane, so she was ready to go. So I got in the car, and I drove her back to the hotel, and Rish came along with us. And I had already filled out a song request form for uh -huh. Rish uh, under the name of Fake Sean Connery. And I put uh, You Belong With Me by Taylor Swift as the song. And I tried to get Rish, and I showed it to him, and he's just like, oh, no, no, no. On the drive back from dropping Abby off, though, he said, Yo, you know, I mean, if they called it out for me, I'd go up and do it, but I'm not going to put in that song request for him. And that was all I needed to hear. As soon as I got back to the, to the place, I went right up and turned in that song request for him. And uh, not too long after that, fake Sean Connery's name came up. And he was nowhere to be found. Yeah, he was in the bathroom, of course, <laughs> at that time. And so I rushed up there and told uh, the DJ, wait, wait, he'll be back, please. He's in the bathroom. Call him again later. Um, yeah, and he came back. And you want to you wanna tell the story, Rish, or do you want to? Uh... We got there the second they started playing karaoke. We saw the very first song. And there were some older people there. And when I say older, I mean like... Is it fair to say elderly people? Yeah. 60, 70. They there. Yeah, and they like I was they were surprised 70. by that because what are older people doing out at all, <laughs> let alone late at night? You know, Because in our society, we euthanize. No, uh, it was just there were some older people there, and then you know people got up, and then there were some country songs that were done, yeah, and there were was, some rock songs that were, were done. There were old country songs, too, that they were doing. They were yeah. generally like but the there 70s. Were, more than anything, there were Sinatra songs yeah. that were done, which is fine. It's Vegas. And all that, but Big by the end of the night, a lot of the older people had left, and it was a whole new group of folks, and they were all around us and smoking and stinking up our clothes. And, and they, I, I, was, I thought, well, the, the kind of music we've been singing up to this point is not going to fly at this. That, that's what I was thinking. And, it, you know, I have a very small mind, apparently, because uh, when it came time for fake Sean Connery to get up there, you know, I felt like, oh boy, I better apologize to people beforehand. You know, this is just silliness. Please don't take offense, folks. But they dug it. Yeah, the, the room really got excited when he started into his fake Sean Connery <laughs> singing. I do the quotes in the air because fake Sean Connery doesn't really sing. He kind of... He sang. Yeah, he sang a, a decent amount. But yeah, for the most part, he talks his way through uh, songs. But he does uh, he does sing here and there. And yeah, everybody was really enjoying it. It was crazy. We, we didn't expect it. But there was like a, a girl that we had, nobody knew. We didn't know this person. She got up there right, right in front of Rish, down on her knees, and was using her cell phone to, uh, to video this, which I'm sure it's available on YouTube if you, can, <laughs> if you can find it. It's probably already there. But yeah, it, that's got to be something strange to suddenly become the subject of someone else's YouTube video. Yeah, I was watching, because I was, we all kind of gathered up in front of him, and I looked over to my right, and there was a, some people up at this bar, and I saw this one guy with kind of long hair. His jaw just dropped as soon as Rish started. He was like, what the F is going on here? Like, he just, he was just like, am I on something? Like, this is the weirdest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. And then he was, 
And as Rich kept going, and then he realized it was almost like improv because there was like, you know, it wasn't just the lyric. He was just being the character. And he was like, and he started like looking around and tapping everyone's shoulders like, are you seeing this? Are you serious? Are you seeing what's <laughs> happening right now? And and he was just having the time of his life. Like seeing that guy's reaction was probably the highlight of, of, def of maybe the trip, but definitely that night. It was just like that guy was so happy. <laughs> we should have. We <laughs> yeah. Like, either really horrible people or like super good people. Like, yeah. Like, we need to bring uh, cards next year. Yeah, find more. Dude, Steve. Dot com. <laughs> Tune in, everybody. <laughs> Woo! And then we rocked out. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, left on a high note. I felt like the DJ was kind of reserved, and and I, you know, I I thought, oh shoot, I should probably talk to her about this and tell her, you know, hey, th this really is a thing, and they're kind of kind of and. But afterwards, she's just like, no, now you're going to do Poker Face by Lady Gaga as, as fake sound kind of thing. So that, that was really cool that the DJ liked it, too. Same with her. She probably doesn't get to hear that. Yeah. She sees night after night. Yeah, she's probably excited for a little uh, a little change. But yeah, that was fun to have let fake Sean Connery uh, out of the bottle in public. <laughs> that was a good time. Uh, karaoke, I think, was fun in general. Sooner or later, we're going to get Brian up there. My, my goal this time, I flipped through the whole book. I was looking for anything that I could possibly know the words to. Because my problem is that my brain just doesn't work that way. Like, I could listen to a song 500 times, and I get up there and I have no idea what the, the next lyric is. And I hear, I'm like, totally familiar with it. But if, if suddenly I don't hear the words, like, I won't even be able to say it. Like, it's just, I don't, I'm not a musical person. I don't sing. So it just, I don't have that connection. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it would be kind of stressful. And then there are songs like, you know, Master of Puppets was really easy because the lyrics are simple yeah. and it's not a stretch to sing it. You're just yelling a certain way, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I was looking, I almost, if I had gotten a little more drunk, I might have taken a shot at Green Jelly. <laughs> yeah, he kept, he kept the whole night through, Brian kept saying, you should sing this Green Jelly, Three Little Pigs song, come on, <laughs> sing it. I don't know if anybody remembers this song, but it was like 92 or 93. An that, awesome video on MTV. Yeah, Green Jelly. And I, I swear they were called Green Jello to begin with, and I think they changed their name probably, perhaps because of a, a suit by, uh, by the Jello Corporation. But yeah, they came out with this uh, song, and it's, basically, it's just the Three Little Pigs story, and it's yeah. really goofy. It's a heavy metal band doing the Three Little Pigs story. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, the, the thing that everyone will remember. And the only thing that I could remember from the song, really, is where they go, Little pig, little pig, let me in. And then they go, Not by the hair, my chinny chin chin. <laughs> really wacky song. Yeah, and strange. he'd have to say, No, no, you should do it, do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it because, yeah, like I said, I think you just did great just there. That's all I can remember, though. There's a rest of the song. What do I just stand at? There was one guy that would just do that. He was dressed as Elvis. And yeah, he would just that get up like, there. I'm hopping and popping. <laughs> yeah. He would just get, this guy who dressed as Elvis would just get up there and go, <laughs> and he would do that through the whole whatever song he'd pick. And then that would be what I would have to do for the rest of the Green Jello song. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. I'll have to start. It'll, It'll be, be the track, track number one, one in my car. I'll listen to it every day. Here we go. Now until next year. Did uh, Johnny sing? I, he, Were you at all tempted to sing, Matt? I needed much more alcohol. I, I had not really been drinking very much, and it takes a lot of lubrication for karaoke to happen. <laughs> Yeah, Johnny got there late, and he was flipping through the book and flipping through the book and flipping through the book, and I finally told him, dude, if you don't pick one, it takes like an hour to get your request through, so if you don't pick one soon. But he has a little less excuse because he's actually musically inclined as opposed yeah. to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, none of us knew that you were a musician until today. Yeah, the, the secret was up until today that I, I actually do sing and record music uh, normally, <laughs> just... <laughs> For some reason, performing at karaoke didn't uh, didn't work out. Well, the the thing was, and I was kind of set on it that I was going to do Folsom Prison Blues because that's kind of my fallback. I don't have to make an effort for it. And as we as I walked in the door, a guy was already singing it, and for whatever reason, that threw me off enough that like I just couldn't I couldn't find my way back to a song I wanted to sing. The hardest thing for me about karaoke is when you walk in there. 
And maybe in the months leading up to going to karaoke, every time you hear a good song on the radio, you're like, oh, next time we do that, I'm doing that. And you walk in the door and your mind empties. It's like, oh, I have no idea what I should sing. For me, at least that's the case. And it takes 20 minutes for me to write down the song. And, and 20 minutes equals like an hour and a half before you're going to get to <laughs> right. sing. Well, there are so many songs in that book, too. It just yeah. takes forever to go through them. And... Yeah, and you look at them and you think, I could probably sing that song. But like I found that last year, I went to sing Rio by Duran Duran. And I'm somewhere in the middle, I'm just like, oh, I don't remember how the melody goes here it's gotten into the bridge or you know something where i'm just like i don't remember how that goes and i'm just like <laughs> okay back to the chorus what's the melody in the bridge <laughs> <laughs> well did you see they have like all these songs from musicals like you could have picked like i could have danced all night from my fair lady uh, <laughs> and they had like tv theme songs like <laughs> That's what Abby was saying she was going to do. Didn't she say she like knows all of Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis or something like that? I don't know what it would have taken to get her up there. I, Handcuffs, I think. For a moment there, it looked more likely that Brian would get up than Abby, which is too bad because she, if she grew up singing all these songs... What was, it, what was she saying about Les Mis songs? She did, her and her friends or something did something. That she would go to Disney World in Florida and they would sing like from beginning to end all of the Les Mis songs like start from the moment they got to the park with the first song and it's like when we finish the the, the musical it's time to go and I, I may be just interpreting this from what she said <laughs> but I thought what a cool odd tradition but yeah she was she threatened at one point that that's what she was going to do was sing one of these show tunes but uh, the only guy who sang show tunes was me because they did a Frank Sinatra song that was from Guys and Dolls. It's, uh, Did they have Hakuna Matata? I don't know. Maybe. Or uh, Les Poissons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it's getting very, very late, so we probably should bring this to an end. Yeah, i got about two minutes left. But I'd like to bring everybody down by uh, bringing up the death of children again. <laughs> no, uh, one thing that has blown me away last year, and especially this year, is how cool podcasters are. And I don't know if it's just you guys or if all podcasters everywhere are cool, but does it come from that you guys do this for fun or for passion rather than for money? And if money entered into it, it would change your whole outlook. But I mean, you guys are so generous and fun to be with and patient. I don't get that. I don't understand why you're like that. Because in my experience, people aren't like that. There are some people that like to go off by themselves or some people that are really uncomfortable or some people that they have to be center of attention and, and, and they resent it when they can't be. And with our, what we do, one day Marshall reads the story and the next day Marshall has no part at all. Yet everybody is contributing, even if he's got one line, as though he's the star of the, the show. In some ways, it is like karaoke, and everybody gets their chance to shine and stand up, and everybody claps for him. But you guys all seem to be the guys who are content to clap. Not me. <laughs> I think we all enjoy what we're doing, and we've done it enough that it's not a me, me, me thing. It's a collaborative thing that we've learned to do. And the goal isn't to be the superstar of every last thing. It's to experience the other people's performance and, and have fun, laugh at their jokes and their takes on the story. I mean, it's it's as much fun. Like, like, I'm happy to do a role that's handed to me, and I'm also happy to be the one person watching it. I, I'm just as happy. I just like being in the group of people that we have here because we all seem to have the same just love for telling stories. And it's not just... I love for reading. It's not, it's just, it's a very specific kind of, we'll read through a story together. If you flub a word, it's like, you know, studio narration, our little playground. We want to learn how to act better and learn how to get some range and learn how to just make a nice, clean story as efficiently as possible. And it's just fun to do. If you go to Vegas and you spend every night in the hotel room for hours recording <laughs> like this, there's a big, that, that's what you love to do. You wouldn't be doing that. In, when you're in Vegas, if you would rather be running around getting drunk or right. whatever. There's all sorts of uh, things here that we could also be doing, that we could be doing instead. 
Yeah, well, and I think the collaboration, I mean, that has been such something that I have appreciated so much because, you know, when, at least for my day-to-day -day life, there isn't a lot of creative collaboration and there's a lot of creative stuff that I do myself, but to be able to interact with all of you amazingly talented, creative people, it's just really special. And the fact that we don't live near each other normally, I think that makes a difference too. Maybe if we were all in the same town, we'd get sick of each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so Johnny came and kind of joined us. So Johnny wasn't here doing, he was here last year, but he wasn't part of this group last year, which is a shame because he's fit in so perfectly. Like, you, Johnny, you do a great job acting and you're, you're, you feel like you've always been here. So is this kind of like, are you going to go home and be like, man, I don't know, I got stuck with these weirdos? <laughs> well, that's because last year I kept asking to do stuff and you're like, no, get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. Um, I mean, I came last year with other uh, friends that I guess, uh, or that are through the same like podcasting network, through the Signals Media stuff that my podcast is on, and we were geared toward a lot of um, kind of just the how to podcast career -y type of things, like trying to figure out like what this was in a larger sense than just us being at our homes and recording stuff, and um, and my podcast is is a heavily scripted, you know, voiced by me, just one person thing that's all like fictional, but like kind of a goofy, weird thing that's not typical of podcasting. Um, so it's kind of great to actually like connect with people who are creating and doing things because most of the time it's like, oh, you do a podcast, what do you do? Or like, oh, I talk about my favorite sports team or I like, you know, I talk about drinking a beer with my friends on a podcast or, you know, where most of it's just like talking in the microphones that is just an excuse to like hang out with their friends. Whereas, you know, it's really great to be able to be around people doing creative things and like, you know, making something that's a little bit more su substantive than just like speaking, you know, for an hour. Kind of like what we're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is that part. <laughs> yeah, we do do our share of that too. We, we, we do these stories just as an excuse so that we can sit around and talk about them afterwards, I think. <laughs> We've been really blessed, if you can use that word, living in Tracy, Arizona, that when he and I first started our podcast, we'd talk for like five to ten minutes afterward about the story that we just read, and people liked that. And they responded to some comment that we made, and they listened all the way to the end. And so now, yeah, we talk for like an hour and 15 minutes after the story, and people like it. I, I, I don't know what it is, that, but, but maybe they just like that we have so much to say about the story or that we care about asking the writer what he thought. You know, we'll always ask the writer to give us an author's note, you know, where the story came from or what the story really means. And then we just ask questions of each other. And that has been great because, well, the, the audience has been really, really, really cool. And we had two listeners come down and, and talk to us this year. And one of them was so hot. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just uh, really impressed oh, that. that uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yes, he's he's got a good head of hair. Tom actually came up to the hotel room, and uh, we even got him to record a line while he was here too. But he had to take off, and then afterwards he uh, sent me a text saying, "Yeah, thanks a lot. That was really cool. That's the first time." Some guys invited me up to his hotel room, and it ended well. <laughs> so, but this is Tom from New York. Uh, he, he even had a, got a special uh, shoot. The the song that Connery that, sang. that fake Sean Connery sang at karaoke night was also the song that he did for uh, Tom. Oh, that was New York Tom. Yeah, that was New York oh, Tom okay. from it's all uh, together. from last year's marathon or our Halloween marathon that we did. But yeah, he came up and, and we were able to talk to him. And then also uh, Rachel came out to karaoke and I, Rachel's local, I believe. And uh, yeah, she came out to karaoke night and uh, she was really cool too. It's amazing how cool our listeners are, cool podcasters are, how that all is. And it's really neat to actually meet somebody that's a listener and have them just say, oh, yeah, you know, I love what you guys do and uh, keep it up and thanks so much and this is great. And Would you like to go upstairs? Um, uh, hey, I'm sorry. I, I drifted off for a second. What did you say about going upstairs? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Oh, 
So, okay, it's, it's after midnight, so we got to let it all hang out, and we're going to uh, call this to an end. But hey, thank you guys for sharing so much of your free time with us, for sh reading the story, for patiently sitting around while we stuttered through the stories, and, uh, you, you know, coming out all this way. Uh, none of us were paid to come out here. We, it, we did it all on our own dime and uh, our own time. And again, it's just uh, because we're passionate about it and... and I'm so happy to say that this was fun. This was 100% fun this time. I can't think of anything that was a drudgery or anything that really sucked this year. <laughs> Put that on my tombstone when I'm killed Brian's tomorrow. Luggage. My luggage sucked. Oh, yes. <laughs> they lost Brian's luggage. And, yeah, when, it, when he finally got his clothes, they were all stained. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we'd like to thank everybody for being here and for listening and everything. And I guess we'll sign out. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rashad Field. And I'm Johnny Feisty. And I'm Brian Lincoln. And I'm Marshall Latham. And I'm Renee Thanks for listening, everybody. Good night, Grandma. Courage. The Dune Steep is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Kick me in the balls. Do you have the balls to kick me in the balls? Little pig, Every little pig. We learned about it. Yeah. I think I goes home afterwards like, hey, honey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kick me in the balls three times. <laughs> Only three times. <laughs> you want to <laughs> Six sales tonight, honey. <laughs> Why did I marry such a layabout? <laughs> did you see that, Marshall, that guy? No. That was, the first that was the first time. Would you have attacked that guy? I'm, <laughs> I do it for free most of the time, so 20 bucks, come on. You he wouldn't a have a card board. pull out a baseball bat. <laughs> hey, buddy. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.